Now we have, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified, he is spoken through the prophets. So, we believe in the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit is God, which was a debated question in the early church. Um, the Holy Spirit, like the other two persons of the Trinity is revealed in the scripture. So we read about the spirit, the Ruach of the Lord, which goes over the void, which is in creation. Um, it shares it's the same word in Hebrew uh, that is the verb to breathe. It can mean breath, it can mean wind, it can mean air. So it's a word, depending on the context, has a lot of different usages, like logos. Logos can mean joke, it can mean writing, it can mean word, all these different words, depending on the context of itself. So from the first sentence, in fact, of the book of Genesis, the first sentences we see in Genesis chapter 2, the Spirit of God is an image that's used to express the living God. The New Testament gives the Holy Spirit many titles. It emphasizes both his personhood uh, and divinity. Counselor, John 14, Spirit of Truth, John 16, Spirit of Ad Adoption, Romans 8, Spirit of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1, Spirit of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 3, Spirit of God, Romans 15, Spirit of Glory, 1 Peter 4. Uh, these titles all point to the fact that the Holy Spirit is the Lord of life. And for this reason, we call him the Lord, the giver of life. Uh, of interest is that uh, in many languages, uh, spirit is a, unlike the other two persons of the Trinity, he is a feminine noun, uh, which in some languages actually changes. I think in, in, in I don't remember which, but in one, some languages actually, if you look in the early church, is used as feminine noun, but then in like after the Middle Ages, it changes to masculine noun. Sometimes we'll refer to the spirit in a, with female articles, so as she, as her, um, and different people identify different things. Uh, with the Spirit. Sometimes the Spirit is identified as wisdom, but other writers will identify the Mother of God with wisdom. So there's certainly tradition for both. So the Holy Spirit, we will talk about right away. Uh, so what the, about this whole proceeds from the Father and the Son thing? Um, so certainly in the early church, uh, in, the, in the Western church, this whole Arianism thing that we've been talking about all day, we have this problem. Uh, and Arianism was a big problem in the West. Because all these um, barbarian hordes who are coming uh, from different places into uh, Frankish territories, into Gaul, into the Germanic territories, most of them are Aryans. And this is going to cause a lot of problems for East-West ecumenism in the 8th and 9th centuries. Because they, they are very uh, are growing political force and are, are very firm believers in the Filioque. And that Filioque, uh, which just is a Latin <coughs> word for and the sun, is inserted because... Uh, in Spain, they're having this problem with Arians, so they're trying to emphasize the divinity of God, and they add this clause, and the Son. And we have to admit that in many church fathers, this phrase is used in different contexts. Um, this is a point of contention, certainly, between Orthodox and Catholics historically, and even some today will uh, still point to this as an ecumenical stumbling block. Um, so they'll say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And uh, that is a point uh, that you know, a lot of capital Orthodox would say is against the Gospel of John. So what does Jesus say? That the Father will send forth the Spirit. Um, bring it up just so you know where it's come from. Uh, it's not in the original creed, so it's sort of outside of our scope of the topic. If you have questions about it, certainly you can ask it at the end. Uh, interestingly, it is included in brackets here. Um, the draft English text I saw did not have it, so we'll see mm. if it has it or not in the it end, what the bishops say. criticized. Uh, I don't know it what, yeah, it was criticized openly um, by some theologians in the right. Ukrainian Catholic Church who are right. older than I, so I'll stay out of it. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Metropolitan Denisha Tisky, I think Patriarch Joseph Stupay actually wrote his doctorate on the Philippine. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. because they're good Thomists, and Thomas Aquinas was yeah. really into the filioque. Right. You know, he was he was very against the Immaculate Conception, but very for the filioque clause. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'll just say that as a and in the Articles of the Union of Brest, though we have to admit that uh, it says in there the Holy Spirit proceeds from one source, as if from a wellspring from the Father through the Son. So there is some tacit acknowledgement of the filioque in the Union of Brest. So on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descends. Uh, Jesus tells us that it's going to come, that he needs to, when he leaves, that the Spirit's going to come. And on the 50th day after the resurrection, uh, the church celebrates this descent. Uh, the great, uh, some people say the birthday of the church, you know, when the yeah. Spirit will descend upon those gathered in the upper room in Acts chapter 2. This sending of the Holy Spirit shows the fulfillment of God's descent upon creation. And this is a gift of God. God sends it down. And so in the Old Testament, when we see uh, that man has exalted himself above God in the Tower of Babel, and so what does God do? He separates them. He sends them all their own way with these different tongues. Uh, after the new Adam, instead of the old Adam, uh, when things have been restored to where they should be, and man has not exalted himself, but has hopefully put God as the, exalt the exalted one, um, God fixes that by sending down the Spirit uh, and unites them, again, through languages. And we read in the Acts of the Apostles how they were able to speak in many languages and be understood. The Holy Spirit bestows a wealth of gifts. There's one Spirit but many gifts, we read in 1 Corinthians. So there's a promise to send the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, we see prefigurations of this, the cloud above the tabernacle, Exodus chapter 40, the fire that comes down, uh, for the prophet Elijah when he's having the debate with the followers of Baal, who actually the Israelites are worshipping, and they've asked him to send down, God, Lord, send down a mighty fire, uh, nothing happens. Elijah tells him to cover everything with water, and the Lord still sends down the huge flame from heaven and lights everything on fire to show them the error of their ways. The moist, whistling wind in Daniel chapter 3 also prefigures this breath. In the Acts, though, it's not a whisper. We read that in Acts chapter 2, uh, the sound like the rush of a mighty wind. You know, you can imagine just the doors blowing open with the sound. Christ himself foretells the descent of the Holy Spirit, and he says in John 15, When the Counselor comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness to me. Jesus also says, I will pray the Father, I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you, even the Spirit of truth. John 14. The Holy Spirit descends as a way to witness Christ. It shows how Christ uh, was saying these things that do come to fruition, and also allows us to understand that fruition. And also, if you read in the, the letters of St. Paul, offers different gifts uh, of tongues and of healing, different uh, charismatic gifts that are present amongst those in the church. So the descent of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles after Christ has been glorified, after his ascension, and after his sitting at the right hand of the Father. And remember the words of John the Baptist, that the, the Savior to come will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, Luke chapter 3. That's what we hear about in Acts chapter 2. So the Holy Spirit grants understanding. The Holy Spirit teaches the apostles what to, see, to say. See Acts 4. Um, it also tells them that sometimes they need to listen to God. Acts 4.19. Uh, we hear the apostles are filled with the Spirit for the preaching of Christ. Acts 4.31. The Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles, builds the church of Christ. And we read in Acts 15. Pour out the power which is from you, the princely Spirit, which you give to your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. The apostles profess the presence of the Holy Spirit in the church and say, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. The Holy Spirit creates the church and gives life to her as the body of Christ, making the church a place of salvation. That's why at the Divine Liturgy we call down the Spirit upon these gifts and we say, send down your Spirit upon these gifts, upon these people here and upon these gifts. All people are called to the church, we read in Revelation, from every nation, from all tribes, all peoples, all tongues, regardless of culture and origin. And this is possible through the Spirit. The bearer of God's grace in the world is the Church, uh, and it 
administers this through the mysteries by means of sanctification, by means of blessings, by means of <coughs> sharing the Spirit with those who seek it. And with the Spirit, there's no death or division. And that's why on Pentecost we go to the cemetery and pray. So I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And we see the church as an icon of the most holy trinity. It is a place <coughs> where uh, the body of Christ, the church, can come to worship. The church is the people of God, the Father, the body of Christ, and also the temple of the Holy Spirit. And all of us as a body of Christ, you know, St. Paul says that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. The church also is an icon of the most holy trinity meaning that it's a community of fellowship between God and human beings, people with each other. It's a way where we can experience communion with God and with each other. Uh, and many you know, theologians will point out that whenever we sin, you know, we sin against, the, none of our sins do not affect all of the body of Christ, but it all injures the body of Christ. And some older traditions, for example, Russian Orthodox old believers, uh, when they go to hear confessions, uh, the person who's coming up to confess will usually bow to the people mm -hmm. first, sort of recognizing yeah. that you know, the sinfulness has uh, impacted them too. We see these biblical images of the church, the church in the Old Testament. Uh, we see um, that in the Old Testament, the ark, the ark by which God saves the righteous Noah in Genesis 6. Um, we also see the covenant that Abraham is told he'll bring forth a great nation, Genesis 12. Abraham becomes uh, accepts his promise with faith and becomes the father of all who believe. Faith in the province of obedience of the commandments of Sinai, this covenant becomes a sign of the people of God, um, the Katak Israel, and that becomes a prefigurement for the Old Testament, uh, for the New Testament church. The people of God, the people of Israel, uh, become that prefigurement. So in the New Testament, we see uh, Jesus' teaching about the church, the incarnate Son of God, uses images like a flock, uh, for which he is a good shepherd, John 10, he calls it a vineyard, Matthew 21, he calls, uh, he says that he's the vine and his disciples are the branches, John 15, Christ is also called the cornerstone of the building, Matthew 21, the church is the bride of the lamb being prepared for the arrival of her bridegroom, Revelation 19. The church is where the kingdom of God is made present. And in that sense, it's an initial stage. It's a place where it's first made manifest. The kingdom that is here already, but is still to come at the same time. Uh, the church is the mustard seed that will grow into a tree, Luke 13. Uh, the field where both wheat and tares grow together until the time of harvest, Matthew 13. The treasure hidden in a field, the pearl of great price, and the net, Matthew 13 also. Christ builds his church and called the twelve for ministry in the church, and the number corresponds to the twelve tribes of Israel. So we see again a prefigurement here. Christ entrusts the church to the apostles as a new people of God, a new Israel, and tells them, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Matthew 28. God's plan with respect to the church is to unite all of humanity together. And we read, uh, on Pentecost, we sing on the Kuntakia, When the Most High came down and confused the tongues, he parted the nations. When he divided the tongues of fire, he called all to unity. Thus, with one voice, we glorify the Spirit. So in the Old Testament, in the Greek, as I mentioned a while ago, that we call the people of God, the ecclesia, the assembly, those who are called out, ekkalo, called out from, from there, those who are called to be separate. The church manifests itself in an assembly, and this assembly is most perfectly happened in the Divine Liturgy. And the Second Vatican Council tells us how the highest thing the church can do uh, is liturgical, the, the, the sacred liturgy. The sacred liturgy is the most important thing because it should be the liturgy that sends us out to do those things like feed the homeless and give them shelter. And then from there, though, we should go back to the liturgy and give thanks to God and get strength to go back uh, to those ministries. So that, uh, you know, the church is not a, uh, a social service provider. The church is the church. And that those things are, should point people to an encounter with the risen Lord. The Apostle Paul calls the church the body of Christ. It says the head of the body is Christ himself and we are his members. See Romans chapter 12. Also Corinthians and also Ephesians. At the mystical supper, the Eucharist is shared with us, and this also is present in the church. 
So what is the church? Uh, we see the marks. <laughs> so you know, if you we learn our catechism, we the four marks of the church. The church is one. The church is holy. The church is Catholic. The church is apostolic. So this is what we read in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Uh, and the fathers of that synod at Constantinople summarized the, the already present then in the fourth century signs of what the church was understood to be. They drew on creeds that already existed at that time also. These signs reveal the fullness and glory of Christ. So the church is one. The church is one because God is one. And ultimately, the church points towards uh, he who is. So we read, for example, there is one God and Father of all, and one is Jesus Christ, the builder of the church. I will build my church, he tells us in Matthew 16. The unity of the church is followed on one faith in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At the same time, we have to say that there are uh, while the church is united, that when we look around on earth, we see divisions among us, and we have to see that these are against that divine call uh, to be one. Our Lord says on the night before, in the great priestly prayer in John, I think chapter 6, but I could be wrong, uh, that, you know, Father, let them all be one. And that's a great obligation for all of us to work towards some kind of uh, healing in the divisions that have happened in Christ's body. This year for the uh, week of Christian prayer for Christian unity, the theme was actually, uh, Has Christ Been Divided? was the title this year. Has Christ Been Divided? The unity of the church is professed by local churches, and every local church has its hierarchical structures and various ministries associated. Uh, we have the orders of the bishop, the priest, and the diaconate, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, but the, the local church is... Uh, the fullness of the church, and those churches exist in communion with each other. And uh, again, we see the Second Vatican Council, we see it in other places too, that historically some churches grouped around a certain particular see and assigned that see some authority. Uh, so originally we had metropolitan provinces, eventually we see the great patriarchal churches that develop uh, where one see is given a certain preeminence, and those churches share those characteristics we talked about the spirituality, a history, a canon law a theology that is distinct to them. So we can see in the Church of Kiev a distinctiveness that is united around the Sea of Kiev that would be different from the Church at, I don't know, Athens. You know, there's something different there, a different experience, a different expression of the faith. In his ministry, the bishop, who functions as vicar of Christ, the bishop has the gifts of the Holy Spirit and should recognize them in the faithful and should call the faithful to various ministries within the Church. And the unity of particular churches is most directly made manifest by the local churches being together. The fathers would say, uh, you know, he wouldn't say, I see, you know, the old Bishop of Toronto is here. And, and actually, Patriarch Newman would always say this, I'm going to go sit with Toronto now, or I'm going to go sit with Philadelphia now, because the bishop is the church there. The church is there is a bishop, St. Ambrose says. And uh, this is reflected by when bishops come together in a synod of bishops or in an uh, ecumenical council when those happen, uh, that there is a, a joining of different faith communities coming together. So the church is holy, as God's holy. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we see that the holiness of, well, while the holiness of God is a source of holiness for the church, that sometimes uh, those in the church, which is not the church itself, but those in the church can come short of that uh, call for holiness. But at the same time, uh, that is why our Lord came, that he came uh, to call sinners to repentance. And we see when we call for communion, we say, holy things for the holy. And the people respond, one is holy. No, we're not holy. Only one is holy. God is holy. God is Lord. The Holy Spirit leads men on the path of holiness, offering in the holy mysteries of the church the grace to repentance and the ability to come to know God in a very concrete way. The church is Catholic. Uh, interestingly, on, uh, in Christ our Pascha, I was surprised that uh, to some extent they really focused on um, the universality of the word Catholic, which is not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but that certainly in the early church, when we said that the church was Catholic, it really referred 
uh, more to a, uh, a completeness, a fullness. We say mm -hmm. the, in Greek the piroma, like the, mm -hmm. the fullness is there. Uh, and that the Catholic Church is that which has the fullness of faith. So, I mean, by extension, certainly is universal. But that was almost like a secondary usage then, that first usage, meaning that it's the, the church that has everything, you know, that the things are there that are needed for salvation. So the church is Catholic, and it gathers a community of the faithful around the Eucharistic table, and it does this in communion with churches all over the world. Uh, the bishop is the head of the eparchy or of the diocese, just as Christ is the head of the church, and the bishop's title uh, reflects the city from which he is. So we have the Bishop of Toronto, the Bishop of Stanford, and certainly in the early church, we would not have had uh, multiple bishops in the same city. So in Winnipeg, we have three Catholic archbishops in the city of Winnipeg. Uh, there's the Ukrainian, a French, and an English archbishop of, of Winnipeg. Well, the French bishop is of St. Boniface, but that's in the city of Winnipeg. Um, whereas we see uh, in some churches have done a better job of maybe maintaining this. So, for example, even the Ukrainian Catholic bishop is in New Westminster in British Columbia and not Vancouver, even though it's right beside each other, but the idea was to not have two bishops in the same city. Or I know the Ukrainian Orthodox bishop, who was bishop of Toronto, is now bishop of York, which is an old suburb of Toronto because they didn't want two bishops in the same city. So it's certainly an old practice where one bishop, one city, and not two or three or probably some places more bishops in the same city. The communion of particular churches manifests a universality of the church, and uh, that there is a communion that exists between these different churches, and we can express that by different ways, by going to visit different churches. Um, and there also is a concept called so sobornost, and that is a, a, it comes about, what's, I mean, it's a Slavonic word, but it's really developed by modern Russian theologians uh, who talk about um, the universality of the Catholic Church relating not just to the fullness of the faith, not just to the geographic universality of the church, um, not just to the openness to all peoples of the church, hopefully, um, but also to uh, maybe within the church a uh, universality in the sense that all the laity and the ordained all have their own roles to play in the church, and there needs to be some kind of harmony between that. So it's not a uh, monarchical pay and obey structure, I guess, is the idea. Uh, so that the laity have a strong voice. And so, for example, um, in some churches, not currently practiced in the Catholic Church, but certainly in some Orthodox churches, the laity would have a role in the election of bishops. Perhaps candidates under the OCA, what they do is candidates are proposed by the synod, and then the bishop, sorry, the, the laity will vote on those candidates the synod provides. So that's uh, an exercise of this concept uh, which emerges from Russian theology an application of the universality of the church. And we have to say, as Catholic Christians, that uh, we recognize a special role of the Bishop of Rome in all of this as the steward of a special ministry, of one who is to um, strengthen the brethren in common faith, Luke chapter 22, to strengthen the brethren, and to be a rock, and to be a shepherd, as one who is to um, be a source of unity and hopefully a guarantee of unity uh, at the same time. In the Epic of Toronto, if any of you are familiar with our history, we had a rough almost 10 year period with two bishops and certainly, you know, was there no Bishop of Rome, I'm sure that would not have ended, you know, that there was a common point that allowed for two separate roads to come back together. Uh, and we see that again and again in church history. So, in current Catholic canon law, the Roman Pontiff has special authority um, to shepherd, to govern, to take care of the church, uh, as well as call councils, as well as ratify their decisions and promulgate canons and different things. So there's a special ministry given to the Bishop of Rome. Finally, the church is apostolic. And apostolic uh, is, means many different things. It means that the church has an apostolic mission. The church is called to go out. We're not just to sit around and be navel gazers, you know, we're to go out, proclaim the good news. What does our Lord say? Go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, it also means that we're founded on the faith of the apostles. It means that we have uh, a faith that has been handed down to us from the apostolic times. So we're in that apostolic tradition. Uh, 
Beyond that, we would also say that apostolic means that we're in apostolic succession, meaning that our bishops are in the line of uh, where the Holy Spirit has been passed down from the beginning of the church, from those the ministry of the twelve, that there is a line that goes through there. That's why we always have three bishops, at least three, and an Episcopal consecration, so that there's always a guarantee that that line has passed through, just in case there's a problem with one, hopefully three will make sure that all is good. So we read in the scriptures, Mark chapter 3, he called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. He appointed twelve to be with him, and to be sent to preach. The apostolic ministry continues today in the ministry of the church. The apostolicity of the church is realized in the ministry especially of bishops, but also in the priests, deacons, religious, and laity who work together for the sake of the world. The bishops have that special grace passed through the, the imposition of hands, the hirotonia, where are they where they are able to teach, to sanctify, and to rule. The bishop presides in love, ordains for ministry his assistants, who are the priests, and he also should enable the laity to function in their role. Deacons also have a special service, uh, and the deacons have a special role, where certainly in the early church, the bishops were usually not selected from the priests. They were usually selected from the deacons, because the deacons uh, knew what was going on in the church. They knew where the money was, because they were distributing it to the poor, to the widows. They knew uh, how to do certain elements of service that the priest was doing other things, so he didn't have that same time to be able to do that. He didn't have that same apostolate in the same way that the deacons do. And unfortunately today, not everywhere, but um, many of our deacons in throughout the church, Catholic and Orthodox, uh, don't do a lot of deaconing in the sense that they don't do a lot of diaconia, meaning going to hospitals and visiting the sick and visiting widows and shut-ins. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen that much. Um, to admit too that in the early church there certainly were, uh, and we read about them in uh, in the early church histories of the, the deaconesses um, who had a role to play again that was based on diaconal ministry, uh, not so much liturgically, and that role uh, is not uh, exercised uh, for different reasons today. It might be a good topic for a question. <laughs> question. Yes. <laughs> I've been a widow many years, yeah. and I haven't had one priest from our parish come knocking on my door. Why? That's a good question, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think unfortunately our parish is, well, I think there's a lot going on. One of those is certainly, uh, with all fairness to our brothers and the clergy, that a lot are doing too much in the parishes that does not give them time to do other things. 25 years. No, I agree. <laughs> not not <laughs> a year or two. 25 years, okay? Yeah. Yeah, that is something that I think we're failing at, yeah. Would the deacons have been doing that in the old days? Certainly the deacons would be going there too, yeah. yeah. Or I think all the Christian faith will have a, a call to, yeah. to go there. Um, certainly the priests should be going to different places. I mean, that's why we have Jordan Water Blessings. are a great opportunity to go to every parishioner's house uh, and to go visit them. And I know, I'm sure it's the same in the States, but I know one of our problems in Canada is because of privacy laws. You know, you can't even go to the hospital anymore. Mm -hmm. If I go to a hospital, yes, even a Catholic yes. hospital, I can't go and look who the Catholics are. Yes. You know? you so unless terrible. somebody calls me and says that, that mom so is in the hospital, hospital right. so I can't go. Yeah. Um, but that's a very that's a good question for your pastor yeah. or your bishop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when you speak of the deacons, yeah. would the uh, religious orders of nuns be taking over that position? Certainly, yeah, there's a lot of overlap. And the roles that we see, even like what the church provides in the United States, the, the church provides a lot more social services than they do, for example, Kent, the church provides almost no social services, the government provides all that. Um, so as we start to remove these functions from the church's sort of sphere of influence, that this creates categories that are uh, perhaps less relevant today. Um, so, um, for example, we can, visiting people is very good to do, you know, we should be doing that, but for example, um, the financial support of widows is probably less important today than it was 1,500 years ago, where they would have been on the street and possibly starving to death. You know, like, I mean, we have social structures, hopefully, in our societies that will provide a cushion for those situations, old age security and stuff like that. Um, so I think now it's probably certainly more of a ministry of companionship, more of a ministry of, uh, of sharing the word with people and giving them, giving them some... Uh, well, I mean, it's a community of believers. We're one body of Christ, and that we should be manifesting those bonds of unity. 
So the church is the communion of saints. The church is the body of Christ. Uh, as I talked a little bit about the threefold ministry of the date ordained. Um, and we also have the distinct role of monastics and laity. And that certainly is uh, hopefully our, our parishes are enabling lay people to do what they're supposed to do. Which means going out to the world and proclaiming the gospel in their own workforces. Of, of showing how to live the gospel and to live the Christian vocation, which is not an easy thing to do, depending on what you do for a living. Uh, the laity are called to seek the kingdom of God by engaging in affairs and directing those affairs according to God's will. They are in the world, but not of the world. Monastic life, too, is the sanctification of the world by the means of prayer. A monk is someone disassociated from the world, unceasingly seeking God, one who sees God and who God sees also, one who loves God and one whom God loves, one who becomes light and shines. And that's from Simeon, the new theologian. The monk unites prayer with the many faceted works of the apostolate, going out to meet the needs of the church. Monastic life, John Chrysostom talks a lot about the prayer of the um, apostles. I like John Chrysostom a lot because uh, you read a much of him, and maybe not. Uh, John Chrysostom deals with this. We sometimes forget Christianity being a, a religion of the city. You know, it's an urban religion. And sometimes, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, um, so a lot of our Christian communities tend to become more rural, as almost like an insulation against the city, because it's, it can be difficult to be a Christian in the city. Uh, and John Chrysostom recognized this and really tried to give people the means uh, to be a Christian in the city and tried to think of little things. Like he would say, invite the priest over, you know, let his feet go in your kitchen and talk, uh, talk to him. He would say, you know, the father has a role on after Sunday, you know, don't just let the sermon like pass in one ear and go out the other. And on Sunday lunch, you know, talk, fathers should talk about the sermon with their children and with their families. Um, he would also talk about the monastic life a lot. Um, and John Chrysostom always was clear that, uh, that we're given this time for repentance, that all of us have these struggles that, well, probably all of us, uh, that we needed to work through to come to better know our Lord. Uh, and certainly it's through the prayers of the monastics that are giving us that time because if God's wrath was able to be unleashed that we, the world would have ended a long time ago. Uh, but that the monk's prayers give us time for repentance. Uh, gives us time for us all, a blessed gift of time to get our lives in order because we seem to always need a little bit more time uh, to get that. And so thanks be to God. Um, and the question question will be, uh, and something that many uh, fathers and writers on the topic of, of this now, especially in orthodoxy, the question is starting to arise of what will happen uh, in such a time when, which might not be too far away, when we have lost those intercessors, uh, who will be praying for the world constantly. Um, and that's, uh, I guess we will see. <laughs> so, this is all great, but so what? <laughs> We have to remember that catechesis is meant to be public. This is not just for me to sit home and read. It's great for me to sit home and read it. But hopefully, we're not only taking this into ourselves, but hopefully we're sharing it. Hopefully we're sharing it in our parish communities. Hopefully as lay people, we're bringing this out in whatever way. I'm not saying you have to go stand in the street corner with your Bible and say, you know, repent. But uh, that there's a way that we're all called... Uh, to have a missionary spirit, to have an apostolic spirit of the church today in the world. It's not just to sit there and collect dust. It's not uh, for us to just keep as our own treasure that we're supposed to. We have this pearl of great price, as we read in the Bible, and that we are to share it. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, the Greek word for tradition, parados, paradosis, and the Greek word for passing on, Paradidomi, uh, have the same root. The tradition is here for us to share, for us to pass on to our children, to our spiritual children, to our godchildren, to our friends. Uh, and this is about an encounter with the living Christ that the Creed should be bringing all of us uh, closer to God by focusing on that, uh, by coming to know these mysteries. It's the symbol of faith, meaning that it should be drawing us to a greater reality that is to some extent hidden and to some extent will always be hidden. Um, from our complete understanding, but should draw us in. It's like when you look at an icon, if you look at an icon on a table, it's always reverse perspective. And so, you know, a picture should be wider in the front and then it goes back, but it's the opposite, you know, in an icon. It's, it's meant to draw you in, to pull you in, 
And certainly all of us are being called to be pulled in to that encounter. So what sort of project? Certainly get a copy of the Catechism. If you do not own a copy, buy one. To form study groups in parishes. You know, if you don't speak Ukrainian, I'm sure somebody you know does, and could probably lead a study group. Uh, don't expect the priests to do everything, because I will guarantee you they will not. So <laughs> empower the laity people. Uh, maybe have your parish council meetings with, you know, just a little, one line, just, I don't know how many, uh, almost a thousand paragraphs, numbered paragraphs in here. Just have one. Read one before a parish council meeting or before your chapter meeting of the system. That's a good idea. Just That's chat about idea. it. Yeah. Um, or dinner in your family. You know, read and discuss a paragraph with your family each evening before supper. <laughs> Study it, pray it, and learn it, and beyond that, realize it's part of a larger tradition, one that's waiting to be discovered by every one of us. Uh, it's, a, it's an invitation for us that Jesus invites us. We read in the Gospel today that Jesus calls us, uh, that we have that invitation, that we need to, uh, to, to accept it, we need to freely take that opportunity. Uh, so certainly, on behalf of the Shatinsky Institute, if you have any ideas, let us know, because the Metropolitan Zereshevitsky Institute in the 2007 Synod of the Ukrainian Catholic Church was commissioned to elaborate uh, the issue of catechumenal renewal. And this is a big question. How do we renew the catechumenate in our church? Look how happy his beatitude is. If you get the catechism, yeah, you'll be this happy like too. <laughs>